There we go. Okay. No unmet expectations. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a bit of a walkthrough about some um, of my experience and observations about ECD in the brain. Um, both things that I think are commonly known and things that I think may be a bit less commonly recognized. Um, please interrupt, raise your, you know, ask questions anytime. Um, sorry. Am I supposed to? Oh yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, maybe we need to do it with this. Okay, can we move? Um, There's no thing I'm gonna do, is there? No. No. There's this. Hold on, let me see. Let me try. No. This doesn't even. Uh, how do we get to go to the next page? Oh, it's not even. Or maybe just click on that. It didn't work. It didn't work. Oh, is two things open? Oh, I don't know. But down here, there's, there's three different ones. So you're not on the right one, I guess. I don't know. Well, it it should be this one, right? Yeah. There, there we go. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ECD lesions in the brain and the spine. Um, we'll talk a little bit about neurologic problems without quote-unquote lesions, meaning without tumors. Um, we'll talk a little bit about thinking and memory problems. Uh, and then just some other miscellaneous neurologic issues and, and what you can do. Um, so by the big group studies that have been done, about one-third of ECD patients have problems in the brain, which is to say tumor-like problems in the brain, like histiocytes, like ECD you know, stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, the most common presenting symptoms of those are problems with balance, uh, problems with speech, uh, and then coordination of the arms and legs. Um, the more severe symptoms can, can be things like trouble swallowing, um, even to the point that people, you know, uh, can choke and cough having, you know, food and water. Um, and then the, um, something that I think is, not commonly recognized, but it's important to give a name to, um, is this phenomenon of inappropriate laughing and crying. Um, when, I, when I see a new ECD patient and I ask um, the patient or a caregiver, does it ever happen that he or she sort of laughs too much or cries a little bit unusually and, and everyone goes like, like this? So um, that is a, that's a neurologic problem called bulbar affect or pseudobulbar affect. And what's, what that, what, the reason that that happens is, um, if you think about it, if you were a Martian looking at us laugh or cry, what you would, you know, not knowing that you, someone was feeling, you know, sadness or mirth or what have you, what you'd see is a bunch of reflexes, tears, you know, eyes closing, faces grimacing, and some breathing patterns, right? If you had no idea what, the, what it meant. And so those are coordinated reflexes that can become disconnected from experienced emotion. Um, and that happens with a variety of neurologic injuries. It's not specific to ECD by any means whatsoever, but I think it's very common in, um, in ECD. It can have very mild forms um, where, you know, someone, it seems like someone laughs a bit inappropriately, or if there's something that has some mild emotional content, there's a sort of an overwhelming sort of crying or sentimentality. Um, and I think it's, if, um, it's important to just give that a name because it can be very distressing to all people involved. Um, inappropriate laughing is sort of socially awkward and inappropriate crying can make everyone think that the person is very sad, which actually is not the case. Usually that, um, in this condition of pseudobulbar or bulbar affect, the displayed emotion is far out of proportion to what people experience. Um, and all you have to do is say, are you as sad as you seem? And usually people will say no. Uh, and I think that can be very reassuring for um, the patient and the family who don't have to worry that someone is, a, is as upset um, as they seem. Um, there are medications that can actually manage this problem. Usually I think that explaining it is treatment enough and, you know, you all have enough medications in your body for the most part. Um, just to give you a sense of what we see when we look at the brain MRIs, 
Um, these, are th these are three different patients uh, with ECD or similar diseases in the brain. And this, I can't see. Okay, so the, um, if you look at them, what you're, what you're seeing in the front is the eyes. This is, we're looking through the center of the brain like this. Um, and then what's not supposed to be there is that white stuff in the middle. Uh, and that is, that's in the brain stem, which is kind of our reptilian brain. There's a lot of valuable real estate there in terms of um, how we move, um, how we walk, control of um, facial muscles, swallowing. So um, you, when you have, sorry? Oh, that would be great. I appreciate it. So that's here. Um, and this is a, it's an area of the brain that can be very exquisitely symptomatic if you have, um, if you have problems there. Um, similarly, this is, you know, not very far, but um, here, this is a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which controls balance um, and coordination. Uh, and that coordination is coordination of speech, coordination of eyes. It's really any, any time when your brain is checking in that what you're doing is what you intended to do. Um, that's what the cerebellum does. And um, problems there uh, lead to difficulty with balance and speech and um, equilibrium. So those, you know, this, this area of the brain is probably the most commonly affected by ECD lesions. Uh, and that sort of constellation of symptoms is the most common. Uh, it can happen very, very, very slowly, you know, almost to the point that it's hard to remember when it started because it, um, it could have been years ago. Um, other kinds of problems that ECD can cause in the brain, um, you know, the quote-unquote dementia that we, you know, is usually tied to things like Alzheimer's. What dementia really just means is loss of function that people previously had in terms of thinking and memory. That's really what that term means. And so I think people with... Um, ECD, depending on where the brain is involved, can really, the presentation, meaning the first thing or one of the presenting symptoms, is just someone not thinking and behaving the way that they used to. And there are ways that ECD can affect the brain, and I'll show you a, a picture which kind of says a thousand words that can cause that. Um, depending on what parts of the brain are affected, people can have trouble with um, uh, continence, either bladder or bowel. Um, if the um, if the hormone parts of the brain are affected, uh, it was mentioned before this morning, about, about a third can have this problem of diabetes insipidus, which means basically your, your brain can't tell your kidney to hold on to water. So people just drink a ton and pee a ton and, you know, on and on we go, gallons and gallons a day. Um, so I think that's, that's something that's been very commonly recognized. I think the problem of mood, you know, brain sort of broadly speaking, um, I think mood is something that um, uh, many ECD patients struggle with a lot. Um, how much that is coping with a very difficult condition versus um, some you know mild form of brain problem? I don't I don't really know, and it's probably a mix. But I think it's um, I I wouldn't I wouldn't let an ECD patient out of my office without asking about their mood because I think de you know depression is um, is important. It's you know very harmful for quality of life and it's something that can be treated. Uh, and also fatigue. Fatigue is just an you know, incapacitating problem that you guys have um, and is just really terrible for quality of life and also can be treated. Um, this is just some other pictures. So this is, a, this is an uncommon manifestation of ECD, but this is the coding of the brain here, what's called the meninges. And uh, tumors can develop there and just sort of take up space where they shouldn't. And then, as opposed to having one little lesion in one part of the brain that's causing focal problems, this is just kind of exerting pressure all over. And so the, the way that someone will be clinically is not, you know, right arm, eyes, balance, but just sort of overall decompensated. And that's probably in terms of thinking and balance and maybe continence as well. Um, this is the pituitary right here, and so this is something um, that's not supposed to be there. Um, and then in a more uh, less common fashion, this can be sort of an all-over-the-brain type appearance. And I think that what the question this morning where 
there was someone who was um, misdiagnosed for a long time. That happens in this context because people are thought to have multiple sclerosis or any variety of things other than what the answer actually is. Um, so in terms of how do we treat ECD in the brain, I think, you know, from my experience, it's probably the most difficult form to treat. Um, and that's because the, the medications that have some effectiveness don't get into the brain very well. Um, the brain is sort of a protected space from chemicals, and in, in almost all realms of our lives, that's a good thing. But when you're trying to get medications in there, it's not. Um, for patients who have the BRAF mutation, they, those BRAF drugs do get into the brain effectively or effectively enough. Um, the other options, the sort of the, the palette of what I would call the conventional, um, you know, ECD medications, I think the, the results for how those do in the brain, I think is, I'd be candid, I would say mixed. Um, I think they, uh, if they're going to work, they probably take a long time um, to do it. Um, there is some... There is some evidence from from, Julie, from Dr. Harosh in, in France that you know interferon, which is really probably the, the the mainstay for more severe forms of ECD, that it can get into the brain and help if it's given over a long period of time. Um, there are some chemotherapies that uh, I have had some some fair experience with, and you know um, other experts have as well. These are more sort of you know old-fashioned not new sexy drugs, these are just, can these are, you know, chemicals that blindly kill cells. Um, but sometimes those, that's what we've needed to do if people are in trouble. Um, some of the other kinds of drugs, like anakinra, are drugs that affect the immune system. Those, I think, there isn't much experience with those doing a whole lot um, for the brain. I think what we hear is sort of what someone said this morning, which is that, um, some aspects of the disease get better, but then the brain problems uh, can get worse. Uh, and then I think the exciting, the exciting possibility is what can we find targeted drugs um, like for the BRAF story that will recapitulate or will kind of will give that same effect for the for the BRAF negative patients. And I think we're we're not that far from that. Um, I'm just checking my time here. I don't want to go over. Okay. Um, ECD in the spine. Uh, so it's actually not very common um, to have Red Hunchester in the spinal cord itself. I, I, have, I have certainly seen it, but I think it's very rare. Um, ECD can affect the spine more in a, in a different way by affecting the bones, because ECD does like the bones or the nerves in front of the spine. Um, it can be a cause of back pain. Although I would say most people's back pain is probably something else, not, not a result of their ECD, um, but it can happen. Um, and then rarely if there's bone tumors that grow a lot can actually grow out of the bone and press into the spine, and that can certainly happen. I've seen that a few times. Um, uh, in terms of this, we mentioned this this morning, this, you know, balance problems without having any tumors in the brain. Um, this I have seen uh, many times, and um, I don't I'm, I'm working on an explanation for it, but there are different ways that we can actually uh, prove that there's a problem. So this, this is uncommon. If you, you take my word for it that that's smaller than it should be. So there can be a form of, um, of, of ECD where this back part of the brain, the cerebellum, you know, shrinks without having tumors there. Um, and that's rare, but I think the people who've seen a lot of ECD have seen some. This is something that is a little bit um, different, which is that all this person's brain MRI is completely normal, but this is a PET scan, which is looking at um, how much sugar your brain is taking up and whether it's um, sort of active. And if you look here, this is all bright and this is dark. So this is a person who has a very normal brain MRI, but clearly there's some dysfunction in the cerebellum because the PET is dark. And I have, this is another similar case. So I have several of these now. So this is, this is real and this is something, but I don't really, I don't know what that is yet. Um, in terms of cognitive problems, I, I think that um, problems with thinking and memory really are uh, uh, an unsung um, difficulty that you guys have 
Um, if I, whenever I ask, usually the answer is yes, that people really aren't fully themselves uh, in terms of paying attention and remembering things. Um, and that's, it's difficult for them, it's difficult for the people that they live with, um, and it can affect people's ability to work um, normally. I think working normally is, is, is difficult when you're not really running full throttle. Um, it's, it's been my experience that this is the case even for patients, you know, without quote-unquote ECD in the brain. And I'm, I'm putting quotes because I'm becoming more and more convinced that ECD affects almost everyone's brain, even if it's not with tumors. Um, and we don't, we don't, re I don't really know what this is, but we're, we're starting to get some ideas. So this is, um, I'll show you a little research picture. Um, so this is a, a study that I just completed looking at changes in the brain um, in uh, comparing ECD patients who don't have any tumors in the brain, who have quote unquote normal brain MRIs, um, and comparing those to normal people of the same age, meaning people without ECD, but um, accounting for changes that can happen in the brain over time normally. And what this shows you, all the color is areas that tend to be um, thinner in patients with ECD, you know, at least in the group that I looked at. Um, and so this, what this tells me is that there's, there's something happening, and I think the people that this is least of a surprise to is you, right? Because I think that, you know, not in every person, but I think that the people who have the, the trouble with thinking and the people who live with them who observe this, you, you need to be convinced the least that there's something to be explained. Um, so we're, we're making a little bit of headway uh, in that. And this is just another look at the brain from, from um, a top and below. Other neurologic things that I've noticed, so there's, um, there's, a, there's something called neuropathy, which is not a brain problem, it's a nerve problem. And the symptoms of that are um, numbness, burning, tingling, mainly in the toes or the feet, but it can involve the hands as well. Um, the, um, you can have one without the other. Neuropathy can be just numbness, it can be just tingling, it can be just burning, you can have any of those. Um, that, so it's a common problem generally, in just in the, the universe, but I, I think that it's even more common in ECD. Um, when, you're, when your toes can't feel well where you are, that can affect your balance. So I think there's some people where that actually explains the balance problem predominantly, although if you have that in addition to a problem in the cerebellum, you're, you're stacking problems and that makes matters worse. Um, the pain from neuropathy can really be disabling, uh, especially at night, can make it difficult to sleep. Um, the, uh, the, it can be the result, I don't think it's directly an ECD effect, I can't prove that, but I think it's often related to things like um, vitamin deficiencies, uh, which, which I think are common, um, more, com or more common than we think in ECD. Um, Neuropathy is probably most commonly in the general population caused by things like diabetes, but I don't think there's much of a relationship between that, but diabetes is always something worth thinking about. Um, and the reason that you guys need to know that this is a reality for you is that the pain can be treated. You know, living with neuropathy pain is, you do not have to do that. That's something that really should be able to be managed in almost all people, if not all people. So, what I would, what I would tell you is, um, you need to be greedy about your quality of life. You shouldn't, um, you shouldn't tolerate symptoms that could possibly be managed. So uh, th you're the only one who's gonna advocate for yourself for that. So if you, you gotta tell your doctor the things that are bothering you, and because some of these things can be explained and some can be fixed. Um, if you, I think that all ECD patients should have a brain MRI. That's in the guidelines that we wrote. Um, if you have any symptoms like burning, tingling in the feet, you should be evaluated for neuropathy. Many of the causes can be reversed uh, or the symptoms, the pain can be treated. Um, you should treat fatigue. Um, fatigue is, you know, in other diseases, having bad fatigue is probably one of the most significant um, negative impacts on quality of life and fatigue can be treated. Um, the least, uh, uh, the least, you know, uh, intervention kind of thing to do is exercise. Um, you know, exercise improves energy. That's just, that's proven. But there are good medications that can help with energy and that can help with fatigue and are tolerable in many people. And 
um, you shouldn't say to yourself, well, it's really not that bad because you shouldn't live with A minus energy or B plus energy because it can be better. Um, treat depression. Uh, the notion that, well, well, wouldn't you be depressed if? Wrong. You can treat depression and you can feel better, and um, I strongly believe in that. Um, you should get your vitamins and hormones checked because those are things that can be fixed. Um, and if you have unexplained symptoms, I think you should see someone who's very familiar with the disease who may be able to shed light on, um, on what you're experiencing. And that's all. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has. Yeah. So the lesion is the mealy word that doctors use when they don't know what it is. Lesion just means an abnormality. Um, and a tumor has this connotation of something growing that shouldn't, right? But with respect to this disease, it's the same. Yes. Thank you. They, uh, they don't uh, normally show um, much going on in the brain. The only thing that I remember them showing was a thickening of the dura. Um, and um, we both know that there's been changes exactly as you described. You're the first person I've ever heard actually say that, um, that there's something different. Um, we did have her go through some neuropsychological testing uh, at Mayo. It showed some, some, some mild changes, nothing dramatic. Um, but again, it's one thing to go through that kind of testing, I know, and it's formalized testing, and, and another thing to function every day in a work setting or in a home setting, and you notice that there's, there's just, it's not quite the same. So I guess my question is two parts. First of all, thickening of the dura, what, what does that mean exactly? And secondly, um, what would be the next step for us to sort of pursue this change that's happened to her? So the, um, the, so the dura, I showed this one very dramatic image of this sort of thickness over the brain. So that's the dura. That's an abnormal thickening of the dura, and it, you can have a modest version of that. Um, that can cause headaches and can, you know, could possibly cause cognitive symptoms if it's very dramatic. It doesn't, I'm not hearing that from you. So that's, that sounds like something I've seen many times just as an ECD um, effect. I think whenever someone has um, progressive or you know, when someone has neurologic symptoms, the the first question is, is the overall disease adequately controlled or not? Um, and you know, should the whole plan be readdressed? The um, evaluation of the neur neurologic problems is, is, we're really in a data gathering sense about that. You know, there's a strong observation, there's something that we can prove in a quantitative fashion looking at the brain MRIs that there's something to be seen, and um, we just need to gather as much information um, as possible. Maybe a higher, maybe a more detailed scan, maybe spinal fluid, maybe a PET scan of the brain. Um, but then treating the component of fatigue can boost as much of the thinking and memory as possible. So that th those those two problems are 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 related to a certain degree. Um, what types of things are you doing to treat the fatigue? Um, so I use medications like Ritalin, you know, it's like the teenagers with ADD. Uh, Ritalin works very nicely. Um, and uh, there are some people for various reasons that's not the best idea. Uh, medications like um, if you heard of Provigil or Modafinil, um, and it, it has a cousin drug, you know, R Modafinil and Nuvigil, I think those work very well. Sir. Uh, I've uh, had uh, 
I've had uh, ECD since 2006. I was became symptomatic in 2013, and uh, it was from an MRI of the brain. They found lesions in my in my brain on the back side and to the side. Um, I, I was on uh, interferon alpha for 10 months. Peg interferon, yeah, and. Uh, uh, it did a really good job. I didn't care for the medication at all, but um, anyway, you know, and then I took a little bit of a break, and then I actually got on venurafenib, and uh, I've steadily come down off that, uh, and I'm on a maintenance dose of one tablet every day, and but I still have those symptoms that my initial doctor told me was because of the brain. You know, I have extreme fatigue, balance issues, cognitive thinking issues, I can't drive, I can't read real well. Um, so I just wondered if, is one tablet a day where I should be, or should I go more, or? It, I know it's hard to, yeah, it's very, very hard. It's very hard. I think that the um, the symptoms that you could ascribe to the back of the brain part, those, you know, I I really have never seen resolve 100%. So I think that, that that's to be, unfortunately, I wish it were otherwise, but that, that's to be, that's to be expected. And, you know, the, the cerebellum, while I said that it's mainly related to balance, does have some role in thinking and memory and things like that, but um, what, what to do with people whose scans have improved and what to do with the doses, it's a very tough question that we're, we're sorting out. I don't, I don't have a good, no. Yeah, I understand, thank you. Sure. Um, meaning ECD only in the brain versus, uh, I don't have a really good answer for that. I think that, um, you know, my experience has been that it, it's not all or none. You, you can have what we'd call a mixed response that some parts of the, some parts of the, um, body get better while others don't, you know, so they can be, they can be discrepant, um, in that way. Uh, I'm not sure that ECD that affects multiple organs is, is intrinsically more aggressive than one that tr that's, you know, fewer. So I'm, no, I don't think so. If I had to, if I had to say yes or no, but, but I'm not certain. Sir. Is it possible what? To, swallowing issues. The, the swallowing issues are really sort of part and parcel of the, all the others, you know, um, and it just depends on how long standing, how long standing they've been, um, and what sort of the, what's the burden of, of damage in the area from, from either active quote unquote lesions or from, or from scarring. So to a certain extent, Possibly, although um, you know, swallowing is one of those things that you can get better to a point, but there's it's safe or not safe, you know, and so that's kind of the. While it's a gray area, there's safe and not safe. Yeah. Yeah. In your experience. Have you seen um, uh, ECD um, manifest in the pituitary gland stock um, and then manifest further in other parts of the brain? Um, yes. So you can have um, um, ECD affect the brain by, you know, with diabetes insipidus and affecting hormones. And you can actually have that, and the MRI of that area will look completely normal. Um, so it is affected but not visibly so. 
and you know, conversely, you can see changes on the MRI there, and, and it's completely asymptomatic. Um, and either of those can come with or without other problems in the brain. Um, for the patients that you've had in your trial so far that um, have it in their cerebellum, how, what progress did you see in their balance, speech, and uh, motor skills? So, so for the, 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 the patients with the, the ECD has the BRAF mutation who went on the, on the BRAF inhibitor, mm -hmm. um, people had very significant improvement um, with a you know, real gain in function, but not to 100%. And, and one thing you said before was that yeah, the last, the first part that was affected would be the last. That's been my inf I can't. That's been my informal observation that if yeah. you know the, if speech was the first symptom, and then balance and then coordination of the arms and legs, sort of what what was, wh where the trouble was first is the last to go. Um, I mean I can I can hand wave and explain that sort of anatomically, but that that's been my observation. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, guys, thank you very much.